Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Sachin Ashok, and along with my teammate Vipul Harsh, today we'll be presenting our recent work on distributed tracing, um, and specifically on how to enable uh, distributed tracing without the pain. Uh, we are a couple of PhD students from the University of Illinois at Urbana Champaign, and this is work in collaboration with our advisors at the University of Illinois, as well as a few uh, researchers at IBM Research. To start off, we make a very simple uh, observation that debugging microservices is quite hard. I'm sure many of the audience do that. But to elaborate, consider this sample microservice system as shown here, where requests go from left to right. And suppose you want to uh, service many requests that arrive at the API gate in such a system. Uh, requests typically take a very convoluted path through this microservice system in order to get a single response. And this can be a nightmare for visibility. This is because many complex systems must be cracked to produce even a single end-to-end -end request, request response. And this is exactly where end-to-end -end distributed tracing comes in. So for example, let's say you have uh, incoming requests arriving uh, at the API gateway, and there could be uh, like two of them as shown here, red and yellow. So all the red uh, and yellow rectangles here correspond to many requests that propagate within the system or uh, they call spans in this terminology. And the job of distributed tracing is to put together these spans in such a way that then you can obtain the call graph of a single request as it is flowing through this microservice. These end-to-end -end traces can provide visibility, which can be very useful for answering queries like uh, which service contribute, uh, contributes most to the delay experienced by the slowest one to two percent uh, of the request, or maybe how, uh, how much time did high priority requests take at a particular service? Please note that such queries cannot be answered by all of the box fan level tracing that per proxies provide today. I'll explain what that is. So, uh, for example, uh, proxies like Envoy today give the uh, ability to the user to turn on a flag and enable fan level tracing, where individual services can log the fans that arrive at them, and then the developer can look at them to keep up. End-to-end -end tracing, on the other hand, can collect and stitch together these end-to-end, -to -end, these individual spans to form the end-to-end -end trace, and this gives much more visibility into the flow of a request through a microservice. So I hope everybody can agree that end-to-end -end tracing is a good thing. So what's the main challenge with achieving end-to-end -end tracing? Uh, the main challenge is that let's say you have a scenario where you have incoming requests arriving at the API gateway. The API gateway might generate different HTTP requests to the backend in order to service uh, these uh, client requests. Uh, the main challenge lies uh, in the confusion that there are many options available for this match. For example, is this the right mapping between the incoming request and the backend request, or is this the right mapping? Without taking into application code, there's no way to tell which, the right, which, which is the right mapping. And this problem is present in every single service that the request interacts with, and any solution that tries to provide end to end tracing needs to solve this challenge of mapping incoming requests to backend requests. So, the possible way this is done today is via head of propagation. So, in this approach, when requests arrive at the API gateway, the API gateway would generate a global ID and attach that onto these requests. And whenever a backend request is generated in order to service them, these uh, global IDs are replicated and propagated via these requests using tracing headers. And every single service along the way does the same job. And this is how header propagation is used, end-to-end -end tracing, because now they can stitch these paths together. But header propagation comes with these drawbacks. So for example, uh, in this scenario, you need to have value from hundreds of loosely coupled services in order to enable distributed tracing, and this can be quite a lot. And even when you do have cooperating services, you can have scenarios where you're interfacing with legacy applications or proprietary applications where modification of that code is quite difficult. And all of this leads us to say that header propagation can be quite a thing. So we, this leads us to the question of can we enable end-to-end -end distributed tracing without application instrumentation. Yeah. Now I'll hand over to my teammate Ripple to talk a little bit about our approach. Thanks. Thanks.
and search it. So uh, now that we know that if we can't use header propagation, let's see what information can we get from Envoy uh, without instrumenting the app that can help us uh, reach into a page. So let's say there are two incoming requests to the API gateway and their corresponding responses. Now we know the mapping between the incoming requests and the outgoing responses. And this can be obtained via the spans that are collected by the, via the Envoy cycles. Now the API gateway makes several backend requests to answer the queries uh, that are sent to it. But the mapping between the incoming requests and the backend requests is not known. And this is because these mappings are buried inside the application logic. So without peeking inside the application, it's not possible to decide which request was sent in response to what incoming request. And this is really the crux of the problem. How do we map incoming requests to the backend request? And, this, and solving this problem would enable us to stitch together these mappings and form an end-to-end -end trace. So how can we reconstruct end-to-end -end traces without header propagation? So let's say there are three incoming requests to the API gateway, along with the responses that were sent out for each of these requests. And as before, there were some backend requests that was made by the API gateway. So for each request, the span level information tells us the time at which that request was received and the time at which the, re the response for that request was sent out. And this, the, and these, sorry, there's something on the screen. <laughs> Do you wanna? No, I didn't see it. Go up. No, it's not on mine. Okay. Stop. Not it. okay, sorry about that. <laughs> so how can we let's do this again? So how can we reconstruct end-to-end -end traces without header propagation? So let's say there are incoming requests to the front end, along with the responses that were uh, sent out for those requests. And as before, the uh, gateway sends backend requests to answer those queries. Now, from the span information, for each request, we have the time at which that request was received and the time at which the response for that request was sent out. And these timings constitute one part of the input that will feed to the trace reconstruction process. The second part of the input are a set of constraints which tell us which mappings are possible and which mappings are not possible. So in this example, you can see that this mapping, if you look carefully, you can see that this mapping is not possible. And this is because the response of the backend could not have been sent out after the response was sent out to the user. So this is clearly an infeasible mapping. And you can also, we can also have constraints that we derive using request parameters, HTTP headers, and so on. And these constraints form the second half of the, second part of the input that will feed to the trace reconstruction algorithm. And the final part of the input is the microservice call topology, which describes how services talk to each other in order to generate a response. So using these three inputs, we feed, the, we feed that to a trace reconstruction algorithm, which outputs the most likely mapping given, his, given a historical distribution of uh, delays at each microservice. So specifically for our previous example, where we had three requests, three incoming requests and three backend requests, it outputs a specific mapping for, this, uh, for the backend request and the incoming request at this node. And it similarly, it outputs the mapping for every service node, and then we can stitch them up to get the end-to-end -end trace. So we tried this approach for a benchmark application varying the request load for that application. And we implemented two baseline schemes for comparison. 
which are based on ordering of the request. And you can see here that as load increases, the accuracy of the baseline schemes decreases because as load increases, requests, requests have a higher chance of getting reordered at any service. In contrast, the algorithm that we have generates uh, these end-to-end um, -end traces with high accuracy, even at high loads. So we asked the question, how can this be useful to a developer? So let's say the developer is interested in answering the following question. Which service contributes most to the delay experienced by the slowest 2% of the request? So here is a latency profile of all those services. When you only have span level information, which you can get today in Envoy via a simple flag. So in the absence of end-to-end -end traces, the developer will look at the 98 percentile latency of each service. And the developer might conclude that some of these services are contributing to the delay. So, and here is the latency profile with our reconstructed end-to-end -end traces. And as you can see, this shows a completely different picture. And if we compare this with the ground truth, actually the reconstructed end-to-end -end traces provide a much more accurate picture of the, of, of the troubleshooting scenario than, the, than when you only have span-only information, which can mislead the developer. All right, so to summarize, our goal is to enable distributed tracing without instrumenting the application. And to do so, we use information from Envoy such as span logs, request parameters, HTTP headers, and so on. And this approach gave us a 96% end-to-end uh, -end trace reconstruction accuracy for, for a benchmark application. Now, this benchmarking thing that we did was, uh, was it does not cover the entire breadth of you know, different kinds of microservice applications that exist out there. But this is an on ongoing project, and we are still um, we are uh, looking into how we can incorporate the various idiosyncrasies of you know complex microservice applications that exist out there, which includes things like asynchronous execution, caching of responses, or you know batching of requests, etc. You can check out our prototype at this GitHub repo, and we'd love to talk to you about your use case. So please come meet us. We would we'd be very excited in working with you towards uh, enabling distributed tracing uh, for your application. Uh, thank you. So, any questions? We, we can take questions now. Yeah. Hi. Do you know what the like, relative cost is versus traditional um, distributed tracing, like using headers or something? Because well, in our case, our distributed tracing is very expensive. So would this be like cheaper or more expensive? Or So we'd be piggybacking on existing sort of logging that Envoy does for requests and request response mapping. Uh, what we would not be doing is actually going inside the code and adding like code there, which can be really time consuming for when you're dealing with like thousands or hundreds of microservices. Um, in terms of the cost, if you need to store the, so end-to-end -end tracing does require you to store the log so that we can do the mapping. So this is not exactly online, so you would, there be a, it would be a staggered effect in that you wait a while for like a couple of seconds, do the mapping, and then destroy the traces that you're not interested in. But uh, it would, does require you to save the traces for that brief period where you can do the mapping. Hey, um, yeah, so it's quite cool to, to not have to instrument the application. I think my question is, if it's not 100% accurate, I'm, I'm skeptical of how useful this actually is, right. because if you can't trust it, you're going to mislead people. So right. I, I guess just like, what are your thoughts on that? And if people don't know if it's accurate or not, what can they do with it? And I guess how, you know, is there a way that you could tell people how confident you are? Or like, what, what are your future plans there? Right, right. That's a, that's a great question. So it is a tough problem to solve. So uh, given that we cannot actually instrument the application, what we can do is try to provide the best accuracy possible. And then for the end-to-end -end traces that you, you do make available to the application developer, you, we are able to assign a confidence score, which we can say, 
which can like you know relate to the developer that we are like sort of ninety nine percent sure that this mapping is correct, and in cases of low confidence, the developer rather not look at those traces. Uh, that's one. Uh, the other is that there is a chance to augment information which is other than timing. So if we can use, if, if you have like a partially instrumented application where some of the services are easier to modify but the legacy applications are not, or the proprietary applications just don't, are not amenable to changing their code, then we could do timing-based analysis. There are techniques for just those parts, but you could still get the entire end-to-end -end trace by leveraging the existing uh, sort of instrumentation. So uh, just to add to that, um, there are, uh, f for example, if you have aggregate queries, if you want to know about you know, some latency distribution for some subset of queries, then we believe that you know, good approximate accuracy should be fine for that. Yeah. So those are the kinds of queries that would definitely be the use case. And if you provide the confidence score, then the individual requests traces can be useful too. Yeah, I think I have the same question, um, a little bit what, what Matt was asking. In these large scale production systems, um, like not having something that's 100% is, is, and we cannot trust it, it's very hard. Because you, you, you know you're always optimizing the bottom or top 0.1% anyway. So it's very hard. My question is, um, does your um, prototype include the ability to only report on spans where you have 100% confidence and just dis disregard the rest? No, I'm sorry, could you repeat that last part? Does your prototype have the ability to only report spans that have 100% confidence? No, so we can report all of them and then attach a confidence score to them so that the developer can decide to look at them if they want to. Are but that's your overall score, right? It's, uh, it's no, no, so you can, per matching, you can assign per a matching. score. Okay. Per matching, okay. Per trace, you can So see. then they could essentially filter out all the ones that are not 100% and look at those. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Right. Um, to, to answer your earlier question, so uh, if you do have a large microservice application where uh, you, know, you do care about that one request that's sort of seemingly failing, it's a really hard problem to solve. Uh, but what I want to highlight is that you could have scenarios where in, those, in that large application, where you have systems that just, not, just do not cooperate, you don't have a leg, you, let's say you have a legacy application that does not propagate the header, you, in that scenario, you just do not have the end-to-end -end trace, right? So if header propagation was completely possible for every single service, then yes, then uh, that would be the preferred option. Well, you know, and the question for me is then, either I don't have any tracing, or I have tracing that I may or may not be able to trust, right? right. So it's, and if that's not clear to the developer, then that might be misleading, and that right. might be actually causing more issues. So yeah. that's a good point. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering about how exceptional cases like timeouts look in your system. Whether it like completely blows up your ability to solve the trace, or if they're absorbed by the rest of the constraints that you have. Right. So uh, that's a good question. So we do. So we do consider those cases, and that's ongoing work in that, like for example, you could have request caching, where like, you know, you, a response doesn't go out to a microservice and it's just cached, and then it goes out. Or you could have like request retries or batching of requests. So what we can do is that, it, so what we do is right now, we use a developer environment to try out these very cases, all these cases to figure out what is the scope or what's the space of possibilities. And then based off the real-time measurements we get, we can use that combination of the information to figure out whether oh, this looks like caching has happened, or this scenario looks like batching has occurred, and that's why the timings are so, or the spans collected are so, and then combine that information to give uh, the right answer. Uh, but this space is quite open because there could be like a myriad of patterns. So you could say, every seventh response, I'm gonna generate a res uh, like a request to a different service, and those kinds of things are harder. Uh, but we think that uh, this solution can apply to a broad class of applications that do not have very crazy patterns. So it's still usable by, a, wide variety of applications, yeah. Yes. Right. Right, so, so the problem is that uh, Envoy can pass the request onto the application, 
but it's the application that decides which other service I want to talk to, what's the semantic of this application flow, which other service do I talk to, and that's the one that generates a new HTTP connection and sends it. So Envoy, even from Envoy, there's no way to know which outgoing request corresponds to which incoming request. It can hand over the request to the service, but it cannot do the matching by itself. Yeah. That, that matching is buried inside the application code, so there's no way of uh, getting Envoy to give us the, that mapping. Like only the application knows. Yeah, yeah. So if the application chooses to propagate headers, then we are in good shape, but otherwise, we don't have anything else. There was a question here. Oh, oh sure. All right, thank you.